My name is Adam. I'm an alcoholic. Adam. I want to first uh, thank you for inviting me to come talk tonight. It's uh, always an honor and a privilege to be asked to participate in Alcoholics Anonymous. Ultimately, it's a responsibility to give back what was so freely given to me. Uh, I want to welcome anybody that's new. You know, if you're trying AA one more time, if perhaps you don't think this will work for you, if you don't want to be here tonight, you know, if you think this is all a big misunderstanding. <laughs> Sorry it's come to this. I mean, I don't mean to be funny, but Alcoholics Anonymous wasn't on my to-do list. You know, I didn't get to AA because I had a bad weekend. I had a couple of bad decades. And for me, like a lot of us, this had to become a matter of life and death. Um, where I live in Southern California, Los Angeles, they give chips for, you know, 30, 60, 90 days. I think they do that everywhere. And I, I was one of those perpetual chip takers. I, I'm, I had so many chips and key tags, I, I could have played poker with them. Yeah, I mean, it was awful. I remember the secretary in one meeting saying, give them back. <laughs> you know, and I recycled through the rooms for 17 years. And I thank God for the unconditional love and the compassion of the old timers who I remember saying, don't even bother taking chips, kid. Just sit in the back. Shut up. But they made it very clear to me that the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous would continue to be open. And if and when I was ready to take actions in Alcoholics Anonymous, that AA would be there for me. And um, as a newcomer, I remember, you know, there was so much guilt and shame about being, you know, new. I, I, you know, doing that walk of shame over and over and over again as a newcomer. And I remember what I would do is I would go into your head and look back at myself and think, what a loser. My goodness, why can't you get this? What's wrong with you? And I know the old timers were judging me. You know, if you're new, we're judging. <laughs> we make bets. <laughs> right? We're not that spiritual. I mean, think about it. I love it when they say, don't judge anybody in AA. You guys hear that around here? What do they tell you five minutes later? Stick with the winners. <laughs> right? You hear a lot of contradictions in Alcoholics Anonymous that are not ne necessarily in our basic text, in the literature. I remember getting out of, you know, rehab, and my, my counselor says to me, he says, Adam, don't make any major changes in your first year. So I come to AA, get a sponsor. What does he tell me? You've got to change everything. <laughs> right? I was told, don't make any major decisions in my first year. You guys seen the third step? <laughs> How about don't get in a relationship in your first year? That's a good one. Uh... No one knows if that works. No one's ever done it. <laughs> Maybe in this crowd. <laughs> but there's a part that we read called, We Are Not Saints. I tell people, if you got a halo, don't let it choke you. <laughs> but the one I love is God doesn't give us more than we could handle. If that was really true, if I really believed that statement, then I wouldn't need God's help. And the longer I've been sober, the longer I've been separated from alcohol the more I've come to terms with the fact that I absolutely do need God's help. I need your help. Help is the dirtiest four-letter word in these rooms. It was the hardest thing for me to really relinquish control and ask for help. And my experience with Alcoholics Anonymous is that AA has done for me what I could never do for myself. It's done for many of us here tonight what we could never do for ourselves. Collectively, as a fellowship and as a society, what I could never do. And, you know, the interesting thing about AA, you know, we, we talk about the steps as being how it works. Really, the traditions are why it works. And for many years in Alcoholics Anonymous, I wanted to change everything about AA. You know, my home group's the Marina Center in, in, in Culver City. And, you know, every week we get these new people that come in and they immediately want to change the format and, you know, change the way we run the group. And a couple months later, we never see them again. 
And I wanted to change everything about AA as a newcomer too. And you know what? The longer I've been here, the more I want to keep Alcoholics Anonymous exactly the way it is. You know, the steps stop me from committing suicide. If you haven't noticed, the 12 traditions stop us from committing homicide. Oh, you don't believe it? Get involved in a business meeting. <laughs> or a committee. One of us doesn't work the steps, one of us dies, right? If we don't work the 12 traditions, we all die. And again, for me, like a lot of us, when Alcoholics Anonymous really became a matter of life and death for me, then I started to truly respect the thing that was saving my life. You know, you want to see some drama? Get between an alcoholic and a drink. You want to see some drama in my life? Get between me and Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, I mean, for me as a newcomer, I, you know, looking back at it, there, what I would do is I, I, I used to come to meetings drunk. Now, the interesting thing about Alcoholics Anonymous these days is if you see somebody drunk in AA, the first thing people say is, oh my gosh, what's he doing here? Right? I mean, think about it. With the event of treatment, which swoops a lot of us up in our most desperate moments, throws us into yoga class, craft hour, nature walks. What I would do is I would go to, we have these late night meetings in, you know, Los Angeles, Hollywood, 11, 30, 12 at night. And I would go to 7-Eleven, get a big gulp cup, fill it up with liquor, put a little splash of Coca-Cola on top. Then I'd cruise into the late night AA meeting, do some of my best sharing. <laughs> Looking for friends. And they weren't laughing. And then eventually I started going through treatment centers. And you know what? This is not a plug for treatment. But by the time I finally got sober, I'd gone through treatment 28 times. Not 28 days like the movie. This isn't Hollywood. 28 consecutive times. And I, I remember telling my sponsor I went through treatment 28 times. I was hoping that would get rid of the guy. You know, loser. Go find someone that's willing. And he looks me right in the eye and he says, You know, Adam, that doesn't make you an alcoholic. And I thought, you're kidding. He says, no, it means you paid half a million dollars for a big book. <laughs> I wasn't laughing at that either. I didn't think that was funny. You know, the big book's making a big comeback in AA. And I'm not going to start quoting pages tonight out of the big book. But page 101 of the big book says any scheme that attempts to shield the alcoholic from temptation is doomed to failure. See, treatment was a great place to fatten me up for another run, but treatment never solved the problem. And I always thought the problem was alcohol. And a friend of mine, he said, you know, Adam, that little bottle of Jack Daniels you got there, that little shot glass, that little drink, that little 12-pack, he said, if that's your problem, you're probably not an alcoholic. And then in the very next breath, he says to me, and if you are in fact an alcoholic, the type that's described in the doctor's opinion in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, your problem is an alcohol. And it took me another decade to understand what he was trying to tell me. Because for me, it was obvious I couldn't live with alcohol. Everyone could see that. From the time I was in junior high school, they call it middle school now. I mean, I'm in eighth grade. I'm already passed out under the bleachers peeing in my pants, drooling on my desk. You know, my nickname was Space Cadet in 8th grade. I couldn't find homeroom. <laughs> but see, the greater aspect of this disease for me as an alcoholic is not that I can't live with it, but really that I can't live without it. Not happily and not successfully. And what it really means for me to be an alcoholic is that I have a mind that somehow always takes me back to alcohol. A mind that always leads me back to a drink. I have a mind, a defiant mind, a mind that will argue with anybody about anything at any time. You tell me it's black, I'll tell you it's white. You tell me it's big, I'll tell you it's small. 
You tell me to go left, I'll go right with an attitude. And then I'll blame you for eternity. (laughs) Defiance dogs my every step. You know, that's why we say denial is an acronym. It stands for don't even notice I am lying. Think about it. You could tell an alcoholic, but you can't tell him much. Right? You don't believe it? Try sponsoring somebody. (laughs) It's my nature. You can lead me into the gates of hell, but you can't push me into heaven. That's why Wilson talks about the tradition of attraction rather than promotion. For me, like many of us as an alcoholic, I had to come to AA on my own terms. I couldn't do it for anybody but me. You know what all the religions and treatment centers have in common? They all send their drunks to us. And I remember it like it was yesterday. That turning point for me when I was in, I was in one more treatment center. You know, I was 120 pounds. I, I was dying of alcoholism. I, I was broken. I was hopeless. I was dirty. You know, I'd let everybody down one more time. Remember that great feeling in detox? Some of you guys were probably just there. You know, and I, I'm sitting in the detox circle with my fellow associates. You know, a vision for you. And this woman from AA comes in you know, on her H&I panel. Now, H&I in Southern California, I don't know if you have a similar committee here, but it stands for Hospitals and Institutions, and it's a committee of Alcoholics Anonymous that brings meetings into prisons and treatment centers and detoxes. So, you know, this woman's on her H&I panel, and she's, you know, talking to us in detox, and she looks us all up and down, and she says, if I could give you all the gift of recovery, I wouldn't do it. And I looked at her and I looked at the guy next to me and I said, what a bitch. (laughs) And then she said something that would later change my life. She said, the reason I wouldn't give you the gift of recovery is because I wouldn't rob you of the journey. And you know, all of these years later, I understand that that journey to recovery, just like that journey to surrender, that each and every drunk has to walk is personal. You know, and if you're new, we can't give you that. That intangible gift of desperation. Now, there's an acronym for you. A friend of mine said God stands for grow or die. He wasn't that soft and fluffy with me. You know, and I had to get to that turning point. A place in my life where my head can't get enough and my body can't take any more. And then people like me die. And then I stop drinking and I have a whole other problem. Because now I got a body that can't process alcohol and I got a mind that can't process reality. And it always takes me back to a drink. So there I am in this place. And, you know, like I said, I know that nobody could give me that gift of desperation. It's almost like alcohol as the big book says, was the great persuader. I had to have a relationship with booze. I had to get to that place of hopelessness. And, you know, my experience now is that I could write all day long on step one. Until I'd beaten down that liquor store door at five in the morning, 5.59, over and over and over again. Or paid the clerk at 7-Eleven after closing $100 for a six-pack? You know, or done a lot of the despicable, diabolical, disgusting things that many of us do on that journey to pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization? You think writing about it was going to help, my, help me see the truth? I had to have a relationship with alcohol. And, you know, if you're new, if you haven't noticed, we're the only people that want a reward because we ran out of a burning building. Think about it. You know, if you're feeling heroic because you gave up your big Thursday night to hang out with us, this is the only place on God's earth where they'll actually applaud because you came in to save your own life. (laughs) 
right? You know, I throw away my job, my house, my car, my relationship. You give me a little plastic chip and I'm supposed to be happy? <laughs> so if you're sitting here thinking about drinking, that beats the heck out of being in a bar right now thinking about getting sober. Welcome to AA. If you're waiting for the miracle to happen, guess what? It might have already happened. You're here. You know, I know that for me, you know, my mom and my family are sleeping better tonight because I'm here. And if I live to be a hundred years old, I could never pay Alcoholics Anonymous back for that freedom. And the relationships and the love and the roadmap to spiritual success that I found because of Bill and Bob. You know, I want to welcome you again if you're new. I, um, I remember when I was new, my sponsor said to me, he said, Adam, I want you to buy a black suit. And I said, why? And he said, well, if you stick around Alcoholics Anonymous, it'll come in handy. Unfortunately, you'll go to a lot of funerals. And then he said something really nice. He said, oh, and by the way, if you drink again, at least we'll have something nice to bury you in. <laughs> he was mean. You know, but my experience today is that if you baby the alcoholic, you'll bury him. I needed to hear the truth about alcoholism. That it... <laughs> that it was fatal, it was progressive, it was chronic. And I know a lot of people throw the, you know, the phrase out, don't drink no matter what. But, you know, in my mind, I think, why don't you join Nancy Reagan's merry band of winners and just say no? <laughs> when everything demands that I stand and deliver, I show up drunk. I have no effective mental defense against the first drink. I can't bring, like the big book says, into my consciousness with sufficient force the pain and suffering of a week or a month ago. I love it when people say, what's your drug of choice? I'm like, alcohol is my drug of no choice. I don't choose not to drink. I'm powerless. Yet when I become willing to take other seemingly unrelated actions, all of a sudden I have freedom from alcohol. And I really think in many ways that's the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, we talk about jails, institutions, and death. You know, that's kind of like hamburgers, fries, and a Coke. <laughs> you know, but I do a lot of service in detox centers, and, you know, there's this, this language that you hear. It's, a, you know, a second language. It's called victimese. <laughs> like they just can't seem to realize that the, the drinking bone connects to the detox bone. Or the jail bone. It's like a big leap for them. And I guess it was for me. That's why I have to continually stay in the middle of this thing. So I can stay really clear on the truth in my life about Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, that victimese thing that they have, it usually starts with, I lost everything. I'm like, I didn't lose anything. It was all drink coupons for me. You know, I know there's a relationship for me between willingness and surrender. And I see it in my life. They seem to be equally proportional. You ever notice you'll never see anybody more willing to work the program of Alcoholics Anonymous than the guy that comes crawling through the back door of your, you know, your home group after a long, hard run? And he'll do anything, right? 90 meetings in 90 days. First day out of detox, he's got three sponsors. <laughs> right? He wants to take our whole coffee pot home with him. Doesn't even have a trunk to put in it. That's how we lose half our literature. And that same guy, 30, 60, 90 days later, is looking me right in the eye saying, you mean we got to go to meetings every day? And like a prize fighter, I throw in the towel and then I, became, you know, I, I start to take the towel back one little piece at a time. I take my will back. And it's so interesting because you hear it in every meeting. People that do not recover, people that cannot or will not. 
And I look at my resistance, the thing that's blocking me from spiritual freedom. And you know what it is? It's another form of denial. Because we talk about admission, the opposite of admission for me is denial. But there's two kinds of denial for me. There's denial about the problem, but the greater aspect of denial for a drunk like me is about the solution. That these time-tested steps, this plan of action, this roadmap to spiritual success, it's not going to work for me. You know why it's not going to work for me? Because it wasn't my idea. (laughs) Sound familiar? Like minds think alike. You know, and I really had to come to terms with what that willingness is. And I understand for me today that there is a relationship between the act of surrender and the state of surrender. The act of surrender is what got me into AA over and over and over and over again as a newcomer. But see, the state of surrender is a completely different concept. That's kind of like what's keeping the old timers here. It's completely different. It's kind of like watching a swan glide across a pond of still water. It's so beautiful. So effortless. It's so graceful. But you know what's going on under the water, right? That swan's paddling like hell. And if you're new, if you haven't noticed, we have a chapter in the big book, Into Action. We don't have a chapter into feelings. (laughs) Go tell your therapist that. Right? We don't have a chapter into thinking. We ought to have a chapter into whining, right? From the podium. (laughs) At the noon meeting. No offense. I'm like, get a job, man. And for me, like a lot of us, I became willing to take actions in Alcoholics Anonymous that I did not believe in. I was asked by my sponsor and my home group to set aside everything I thought I knew about AA, about the 12 steps, about God, so I could have a new experience with this thing. Everything that I thought I knew about God, about myself, and about others. Because if you added up those three relationships, when I came to AA, if you took my relationship with God plus my relationship with self plus my relationship with others and you put an equal sign under it, it's simple math. You know what it equals, right? Detox! (laughs) Now, in the therapeutic community, there's a science called cognitive behavioral therapy. It's expensive, right? In AA, it's a buck. (laughs) And it's one sentence. You can't think your way into right living, but you can live your way into right thinking. Very, very simple. Bring the body, the mind will follow. Now, for me, that was the hardest thing in the world to do. Because I couldn't set aside my old ideas. I couldn't let go of a belief system that I had established from the time I was a child. And it's so interesting because, you know, we have a a circle and a triangle, the three legacies of AA, recovery, unity, and service. And it's been revealed to me just from experience that that triangle, recovery, unity, and service, translates into three specific actions for me. Contribute, belong, and learn. Contribute is service. Belonging is unity. To learn is to uncover, discover, and discard what's blocking me. And the more that I sit in the center of that triangle and take those very simple actions, the more that I somehow feel wanted, needed, and loved in every area of my life. And if you're new, we can't give you that without taking the action. You know, I couldn't experience that until I was willing to take actions here that I didn't believe in. It's just that simple. If if there's a weight pile and I lift weights every day, am I going to get strong? It doesn't matter how I feel about it. What I think. And those simple actions in Alcoholics Anonymous eventually began to change my perception. All of my life, I predicated everything on how I felt. I don't feel like showing up for work. I don't feel like sitting in the front. I don't feel like taking commitments. I don't feel like being responsible. And in Alcoholics Anonymous, I had to reverse that process. And by taking the actions, my thinking and eventually my feelings changed. And it's just that simple. And if you're new, I I, I wish... 
we could give you that, but like everything else, I had to take the action. And we talk about drinking all day long. If you haven't experienced it, you couldn't really understand why we do what we do. That's why normies are like, I can't believe you did it again. You know, now, speaking about hospitals and institutions, H&I, I do a lot of H&I. You know why? Because I'm an alumni from everywhere. <laughs> And one of the panels that I have at the, at the Veterans Administration, uh, you know, I've had it for years. One of the greatest illustrations of surrender that it ever experienced came out of one of those panels at the VA. Now, you get into a room, you know, we have big meetings at the VA in West L.A., you know, maybe like 100, 150 guys, soldiers. Now, you get in a room full of soldiers and you start talking about surrender. You know what happens, right? Room gets quiet. Dead quiet, especially Marines. You know, but if you ever watch a soldier surrender like on CNN, the illustration's perfect. And you might want to relate it to alcohol if you're new. You ever watch a soldier surrender, you'll see the soldier take the rifle, very slowly lay it on the ground, sit down on the side of the road, wait for someone to tell him what to do. Right? When you got 40 AK-47s pointed at your head, you don't throw down the gun with an attitude. <laughs> kind of like these guys put their court cards in the basket. Think about it. You're not sitting on the side of the road looking back at the gun, because if you do, someone's going to shoot you. Am I looking back at alcohol? Am I looking back at the magic that I once found in booze? Is that the euphoric recall, the peculiar mental twist, the lurking reservation that Wilson talks about? Is that what it is? It's so interesting because for me, when I look back at it, it's almost like I'm in the high school gym 25, 30 years later. Girls are gone, the lights are out. It's an empty room, it's dark. I'm all by myself in that room saying, where's the party? Now, there's no disco ball where I was drinking. You know, we talk about my worst day sober is better than my best day drinking. My worst day sober is better than my last day drinking. And I think about those moments when life had its moments. And for those moments as an alcoholic, I'm willing to give my life. To recapture and recreate the magic that I once found in booze. It's almost like Oz never gave the Tin Man anything he didn't already have. What am I trying to put in myself that's not already there? Because that idea will kill me. You know, it's interesting because there's a guy named Dr. Harry Tebow and... You can look him up on the internet. It's not an outside issue. In fact, he's one of the contributing members to some of our original literature. And, and Tebow talks about the difference between compliance and surrender. And it's interesting because, you know, compliance by definition is cooperation without agreement. And I've been in compliance with AA for years. Doing it for sober living. Doing it for the judicial system. Doing it for the parole department doing it for DCSF. Where I live on the west side of L.A., they do it for the trust fund. <laughs> but see, that concept of surrender, kind of like that soldier that lays down that rifle, that concept is unconditional. If you're new, for me, I had to see that there could be no reservation. I had to get to AA on my own terms. That's freedom. I mean, we say freedom is another definition for nothing else to lose. I had nothing else to lose at that point. It became do or die for me. You know, and I eventually got to that place and I was able to see the truth. Because if you're like me as an alcoholic, fear's not going to keep someone like me sober. Fear doesn't work. Getting a third strike, living on the street, being homeless, losing my career, throwing away my education, losing my family. Did scared straight work for you guys? Went right over my head. Now the big book, 
talks about the problem drinker and illustrates the problem drinker as someone that can stop or moderate given sufficient reason, right? Big difference between a problem drinker and an alcoholic. Think about it. You get a problem drinker and a real alcoholic in a jail cell for, say, drunk driving. You get two completely different philosophies going on. You get the problem drinker over here sitting on one side of the cell, you know, beating on the table thinking, man, why did I have that fifth beer? I knew I shouldn't have drank so much. Why did I drink so much last night? The real alcoholic sitting over here on the other side of the cell thinking, why did I take Interstate 4? <laughs> Oh, the court card people never laugh at that joke. <laughs> right? <laughs> Problem drinker's wife says, Honey, if you don't stop drinking, I'm leaving you. Problem drinker cleans up his act, doesn't drink in the house, gets a little visine. Now, if my woman says to me, Honey, if you don't stop drinking, I'm leaving you. You know what I'm thinking, right? I'm thinking about single life. <laughs> and I got to look at my relationship with alcohol because if anything got in the way of alcohol, it was out of my life. I mean, alcohol completed me. It had me from hello. I used to say, don't drink no matter what, but alcohol wouldn't listen. Alcohol was my master. It owned me. And if anything got in the way of booze, it was out of my life. In fact, I slowly compromised everything to continue to drink. And if you're new, my experience with Alcoholics Anonymous is almost the same. If anything gets in the way of my recovery, it's out of my life. A woman, I don't care how beautiful she is, how much she loves me, how great she makes me look. Oh, I got an ego, I'm entitled. I remember the first time I said that from the podium, there she was in the back of the room. She's like, honey, you don't look like an alcoholic. Oh my goodness, you're not speaking again. It's the weekend. Why do you got to go to all those meetings, honey? Oh my gosh, you know, that program of yours, it's getting in the way of our relationship. Yeah, you heard that too, huh? So a couple months later, it, you know, it's Thanksgiving dinner. It's meet the parents night. I'm at the head of the table, her and her lovely family. Out comes the exotic wine. She's like, honey, you can have one glass of wine. Oh, come on, just one glass. Sweetie, it's natural wine. Four more rehabs. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I stole her purse that night. <laughs> Went down to the hood and got an outside issue. <laughs> oh, you guys relate to that, huh? <laughs> and she came to detox with a get well card. <laughs> oh, yeah. I... I got four cards from that one. <laughs> she had another problem. Yeah, for her, a slip was ten minutes of compassion. I know, I spoke at an Al-Anon convention a couple of weeks ago. They didn't like that. They can't stand to see us have fun. I tried to send her to Codependence Anonymous. She wouldn't go. You know why? She didn't have anyone to go with. <laughs> it's horrible, isn't it? I told her when she dies, someone else's life will flash before her eyes. I'm going to quit before I get fed to the alligators. You know, but that's the reality for me. If anything gets in the way of AA, it's out of my life. I have sponsees that pay more in taxes than I earn all year. They have these huge careers and these little tiny AA programs. I've never seen one of them stand the test of time here. 
What do I do for a living? Oh, I stay sober. Oh, what do I do for money? That's over there. Now, if I get those two things mixed up, I'm back in handcuffs. I get those two things mixed up, I'm back in an emergency room. Or I get a double header, I'm handcuffed to a gurney in an emergency room. <laughs> oh, I've been there. Anything I put in front of Alcoholics Anonymous. In fact, you know, when I look at it, what I would do is I would build Alcoholics Anonymous around my big life. And as my life slowly expanded, what would happen is AA would become more and more inconvenient. And what I've had to do in order to stay here and really thrive is to build my life around Alcoholics Anonymous. So if you're sitting in here and you feel like you're on the outside of this thing looking in, maybe you are. And I had to really think about it. Was I really committed to a home group? You know, like that triangle, recovery, unity, and service, my head, my heart, and my feet had to be moving in the same direction. My head is inventory, my heart is service, my feet are meanings. That's what being in the middle of it is. And there's a big difference between being in AA and on AA. It's kind of like the difference between being in a submarine or on a submarine. (laughs) Right? When the ship takes a dive, I guarantee you'll find out if you're in it or on it. And the book talks about the certain low pots. Will I survive those low spots ahead? Life or death? See, for me, self-knowledge won't fix me. I've had every relapse prevention class known to man. You know, half a million dollar big book, believe me. I've had all the therapy available. And I'm behind a dumpster again on Skid Row in downtown Los Angeles, drunk, drooling on myself with a bottle of whiskey, reciting chapter 5 out of the big book. (laughs) Right? And the bum next to me is like, will you shut up, man? You're ruining my high. Give me that bottle. And I'm crying because I can't get back here. Because I got a head full of AA, I got a belly full of booze, and I'm separate, different, and alone one more time. And if you think that sounds painful, you know what's worse? Being in this room tonight, being a real alcoholic, and not working the 12 steps. It could be worse. Coming to meetings late, leaving early, not having commitments, not having a sponsor, not being of service. I mean, it's worse. You have no anesthetic. You know, and it's very interesting because, you know, we always talk about the guy in his first 30 days, and we have these moments and milestones of recognition First 30 days, 60 days. We ought to have a moment of recognition for the guy or girl in their last 30 days. Think about it. You can always spot them. Just ask them how they're doing. I'm fine. I'm like, really? Why don't you tell your face that? But it's, see, it's a tragedy because you always hear about him later. Remember so-and-so used to sit in the front row? He went home and shot himself. Overdosed. Got a third strike. See, I don't want to be in my last 30 days. I know what it's like to sit in a room or a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and be in my last 30 days. And you hear people say, oh, we're all the same distance from a drink. I don't believe that. You think this guy here has got four or five commitments, working with new people, has a home group, has a sponsor? You think he's the same distance from a drink as this guy here that's doing nothing? And I don't mean you. (laughs) You get for sitting in the front row, right? (laughs) See, all of my life I was one decision away from a drink. And today, between me and that decision, there's a whole world called Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's about commitment. It's about tradition. It's about people like you. It's about rooms like this. It's about a loving higher power in the midst of all of that. And we talk about, you know, you know why the grass is greener over there? It's because they're watering it. And I didn't understand that relationship. 
And I saw myself one more time back in relapse prevention class, learning about my triggers. <laughs> counselor, counselor, waking up to trigger for me. <laughs> like, sir, will you please go back to your dorm? I remember telling my sponsor, I said, you know, sponsor, I, I had a degree when I came to AA. And you know what he said to me? He said, you know, Adam, thermometers have degrees. You know where they stick those? <laughs> he was mean, vicious, insensitive to my feelings. <laughs> See, the knowledge is necessary. It's necessary for me to win the confidence of a newcomer. Where no one else could do it. Where the clergy couldn't do it. Where the therapist couldn't do it. Where the drug and alcohol counselor couldn't do it. Where the parole department couldn't do it. Another drunk was able to win my confidence. Because he lived like me. He felt like I did. Not just with a drink in his hand, but more importantly, in untreated alcoholism. Another alcoholic was able to win my confidence when we talked about resentment. When we talked about selfishness. When we talked about dishonesty, when we talked about fear, another drunk was able to win my confidence because he lived and felt like I did. And you know what the greatest thing I ever heard in AA was? Three simple words. Yeah, me too. And somehow through that process, I realized how really the same so many of us are. It, just, it was just that simple. You know, on the way over here, we were talking, I, I know a crowd like this. Do you guys remember Gilligan's Island? <laughs> Did you ever notice that Gilligan's Island was a seven deadly sins? <laughs> Think about it. The captain was gluttony. Gilligan was sloth. Marianne was envy. Ginger was lust, right? <laughs> Mr. Hell was greed. Come on, I would have killed everyone on the island but Ginger. <laughs> Maybe I would have kept Marianne around for a little drama. <laughs> but see, the process of another drunk working with me and me working with someone else is that I saw that all of these instincts and all of these defects and these shortcomings that we talk about are a natural part of being human. The things that I was so ashamed of, these defects... And it's so common. What I do is I, you know, I put down the drink and then I pick up the fork. That's gluttony, right? Next thing you know, I'm naked in front of the mirror and I'm crying my eyes out saying, God, I can't live like this. Step six and seven. So what do I do? I put down the fork and then I pick up the credit card. Now I'm going to fix what I did with the fork, right? I'm in liposuction. I'm back at Ross buying clothes, trying to, fig trying to cover it up. Then I'm in bankruptcy court, on my knees, in step six and seven, saying, God, I can't live like this. So I put down the credit card and start acting out in the rooms. Can't go to that meeting again. I love it. There's 412 step programs. They're all identical except for the first half of step one. And my experience is it's so easy for me to play musical poisons in the first half of step one and never really address the problem. And I did that over and over again. And what my book says is that when we straighten out spiritually, we straighten out mentally and physically. So I love it. You come into AA and you got all these other things going on. You've got alcoholics. Then you've got alcoholic addicts. Then you've got addict alcoholics. They're somehow different, right? <laughs> of course, you've got the dope fiends in the back. They're worse than all of us. And my experience with AA today is that if we don't have a common problem, we don't have a common solution. Alcohol. My mind always takes me back to drinking. Self-knowledge. You notice at the end of these meetings, they don't say, keep coming back. It works if you know it. <laughs> it says, works if you work it. And my experience is that these principles, it is only through application and practice that I become spiritually fit. Thinking it through doesn't work for a guy like me. I love it when they say, just play the tape through. I love that. I'm driving my brand new car down the freeway, past Skid Row, and I play the tape through. 
to the, the cardboard box, the dumpster. And you know what my head tells me? Oh, Skid Row wasn't that bad. <laughs> Toothless honey, I can make it on Skid Row. <laughs> That's insanity, you know. Normal people don't laugh at that. <laughs> Think about it. I always thought insanity was doing the same thing and expecting different results. Isn't that what you hear in AA? That's not the insanity I live with. I have a completely different brand of insanity. It's doing the same thing, knowing exactly what's going to happen and what? Doing it anyway. <laughs> Come on, at least the other kind of insanity, doing the same thing and expecting different results, at least there's some hope there. <laughs> but I know exactly what's going to happen and I do it anyway, which points back to what it really means to have lost the power of choice. Now, I don't want to offend anybody tonight, but, you know, for me to pick up a drink is kind of like having sex with a gorilla. Oh, honey, if you have sex with a gorilla, it's not over until the gorilla says it's over. <laughs> I know, you get that gorilla back in the cage, it starts looking at you again with those loving eyes. <laughs> Remember how it used to be? Just me and you? I promise I won't tell anybody. We're in Mexico. Awful. But that's the way my mind works on me. Delusion. You know, it reminds me of this guy. He gets a rifle for his birthday. And his lifelong ambition, he's a hunter, he always wanted to go to Alaska, uh, to the tundra, and, fi- and shoot a polar bear. He's a hunter. So he goes up, he flies up to the tundra, he's got this brand new rifle he got for his birthday. He sees this bear, he takes his shot, and he goes over to look at his kill... And there's a tap on his shoulder. It's a bigger polar bear looking down at him. Yeah, the bear says, you just shot my son. You got two choices. Either let me have my way with you, or I'm going to maul you to death. So a couple weeks later, he's in the hospital healing up. Now he's got a resentment. So he gets better. He goes back up to where the bear is. He's going to get this bear. So he goes to the exact same spot, he sees the bear, he takes his shot, goes 